Robert, and today we're going to talk about containers. So when we talk about containers, let's start with something we know first. Let's talk about VMs. So when we talk about VMs, we're talking about abstracting hardware. VMs were made with a specific purpose, to get more out of our underlying hardware resources. We introduce a hypervisor. And from our hardware, we create logical, abstracted components that we call VMs. In our VMs, we typically install an operating system. We install applications, and we usually provision some kind of configuration to make the application provide a service, to make the application do something useful for, for us. Now, standing up a VM, you know, takes quite a lot of steps, right? We have to install, we have to install these different layers, and we have to maintain these layers over the lifetime of this VM. So the kind of stuff we install in VMs is, you know, the, the, the kind of application components you're probably familiar with. We might have a, a web server, and we might have a backend database. This is your typical monolithic app. And the VMs themselves are also quite monolithic because we have all these layers we have to install and maintain. Now, containers, on the other hand, are quite different. Containers don't abstract hardware. They abstract an underlying OS. So in our hardware virtualization, the, the hardware acts as the host for the virtualization. A container is really nothing more than a packaging format. It contains just enough to run an application and nothing more. In our monolithic VM world, when you look inside the VM, there's many different processes running in our VM. The operating system might have dozens to hundreds of processes running. These applications that we install probably run dozens of, of processes. A container, on the other hand, is concerned with running just one process and running it well. It contains the bare minimum needed to only run that one process. Therefore, it depends very heavily on the, on the underlying OS. Now, in hardware virtualization, um, we're abstracting the hardware, but the VM is very much its own object. Um, it's so independent of the hardware the layer abstraction is so large that we can actually take the VM and move it to a, a different physical hardware host, which is a process we know as vMotion, for example. But containers are so dependent on the underlying host OS that um, it's very hard to move them. Um, but maybe we shouldn't want to move them. Because they contain only the bare minimum needed to run the process um, they're running, um, they're incredibly small. We count their sizes in the tens to maybe hundreds of megabytes max. Um, because they're so small, that means they're extremely portable. We can take a container image and run the container very quickly, multiple times, across one underlying container host or multiple container hosts. and we can spin them up in seconds. They're so small that it takes almost no time to instantiate them. And compare that to a VM where it can take, you know, several minutes or even longer to get a single VM up and running, especially if it's running a very large, complicated uh, application. Now, um, because VMs are so port... Now, because containers are so portable, um, they lend themselves extremely well to something we call microservices architectures. In our traditional monolithic world, the components of our application there are pretty big, and a lot of the functionality of the application is combined into a single layer. In microservices architectures, an application consists of many different components that run independently from each other, are loosely coupled, and are probably versioned uh, separately and usually talk to each other through APIs. This lends itself extremely well to container technology. 
because it allows each part of our microservices architecture to be delivered in the form of a container. It also means that we can scale the different parts of our application extremely easily. If we need a, a, a middleware component, for example, um, to have more capacity, we can simple, simply instantiate more of the same type of container that runs that particular service. So containers lend themselves extremely well to microservices architectures because each individual part of our application can be delivered as its own container. And remember, containers are concerned with doing one thing really well. It allows us to scale out the particular parts of our application extremely quickly and efficiently. If we need to increase the capacity of a particular layer, we simply have more of the same container instantiate. And we can do this times five, times 10, times 100, and extremely quickly because they're so small, they start up really fast. And we'll probably instantiate them over different underlying hosts and then load balance over them for availability. Remember that we can't view motion containers like we could VMs, so we rely very strongly on load balancing to ensure the availability of our, un of our um, service. So um, a, container, a containerized application landscape um, is more concerned with, with the service that the containers provide than the containers themselves. The containers are simple, um, they do one thing, and because we can create so many of them at will, we don't really care about each individual container. But a VM, on the other hand, it takes a long time to provision them. We tend to take care of them. We update the different layers they consist of. So we tend to view VMs as, as pets, like you would care for your cat or your dog. Containers, on the other hand, we don't care if an individual container dies. All we care about is that the above-lying service remains available. So this model is often referred to as cattle. So this difference between pets and cattle means that these logical objects are managed in a very different way. Just like with VMs, we need a control plane to manage the VMs and the placement of VMs um, on our underlying infrastructure. And in, in the VMware world, we know that as the virtual center. In the container world, in the container landscape, um, we need a similar function, a similar control plane. Um, and these days, there's a simple, it's not simple. <laughs> um, in this container landscape, um, we need some kind of orchestration to place and schedule the running of our containers um, across our different underlying OS hosts. And the standard for this is Kubernetes which we write as K8S, Kates. Now our OS hosts, um, in Docker terminology, they're called Docker hosts. In Kubernetes terminology, um, they're usually referred to as nodes or worker nodes. And these will still need to be provisioned somehow, so this is where our VMs come back. These are probably VMs, but there's a big difference in this, in the way this is built up. So in our container landscape, the emphasis of management changes. In our classic VM world, we had to concern ourselves with managing all the layers within this VM. But in the container world, we don't need to care as much about the applications because they come prepackaged and we give them a configuration they need to start at runtime. But most of their process is, is done automatically by a product like Kubernetes. So the emphasis of our administrative effort changes from managing the whole monolith to managing the orchestration around the application layer. But of course, these Docker hosts or Kubernetes worker nodes are going to be VMs and they're going to run on the same underlying vSphere infrastructure. So some things don't change. There's another important difference between VMs and containers. In a VM, because we are installing all these different layers, they're relatively complicated to instantiate. And it takes a lot of time to provision all these layers inside the VM. Even if you automate it fully, it still takes quite a long time. So we don't like replicating that effort. With VMs, we're very much used to saving the state of the VM and sometimes the, 
what's saved inside the VM is so valuable that we even back up the whole VM. Containers, on the other hand, um, operate from a principle of statelessness. They are simply a packaged set of binaries running a single process. The default assumption with containers is that they don't save anything to disk. If something needs to be saved to disk within a microservices architecture, it usually ends up in an external database somewhere. But the components comprising our application are not assumed to have any state themselves. If one container dies, uh, we don't care. Remember, they're cattle. Um, the only thing we care about is that the service that they provide remains available. So that implies that there can't be any valuable data inside these containers to save. This is what we mean by statelessness. Um, another way of saying it is that they're ephemeral. We should be able to lose a container without affecting anything else. This is a fundamentally different approach than a VM. With a VM, we almost always provision the VM with virtual hard drives that will save the operating system, the application, and the configuration, and any static data that the layers of, the, of our VM are, are trying to write to disk. In containers, we have to take care of state differently. We either transport it to a separate database. We can provision persistent storage to containers, but we have to do so explicitly through our container orchestration layer. Kubernetes has a wide range of plugins that the different storage vendors, including VMware, are using to provision underlying physical storage to our container landscape in case our containers need to write some data to disk. VMware's plugin for Kubernetes is called the vSphere Cloud Provider. But we'll cover that and the rest of Kubernetes in a follow-up video. For now, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time. So if you enjoyed this video or any other video of uh, ITQ Lightboard sessions, subscribe to the channel. Do it I now. Do.